This is Danny Flexen here for Seconds Out. Delighted to be joined by US prospect for Sean Johns. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Not long now till your next fight. You spent a long time out before coming back in December. Um, would you have liked that fight to have lasted a bit longer, given how long you've been out of the ring? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, my opponent couldn't handle what I was bringing. So the fight was over within the first round. And that was your um, first contest back, as I say, in just about a year, uh, I yeah. think, since, since the fight yeah. with Alex Vargas. Just tell us about the reflections from that fight. It was your first defeat, of course. A lot of boxers find that tough to deal with, but you've come back, you're, you're being busy as well, which is always a good sign. What were your reflections on that fight? Um, my reflections on that fight was just a learning experience. You know, um, it's two undefeated fighters, you know, the best fight and the best. Um, a lot of people wanted me to wait further down the line to fight that, to make that fight happen. But um, I was, I was kind of antsy, you know. I was just like, you know, they're really talking about him. I was like, I fought at the Paramount twice already. You know, he's the hometown kid. We all knew that going in. So I was like, you know what, I want to fight him. So may the best man win. And, and uh, Alex Vargas, he was the victor in that fight. What, what did you make of the fight itself? You know, the scorecards maybe didn't do you justice, but what, what do you feel you could have improved on? What could you have done differently? Um, I definitely could have... Uh, Definitely put, put up my uh, punch output a lot more. I was uh, highly more defensive in that fight um, a lot. Um, I make no excuses of it. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but I was coming off of eye surgery. Um, that's why a lot of people didn't want me to take the fight. They wanted me to get something a little bit more, you know, easier, you know, and I was just like, eh, I just got impatient, but that's me. You know, that's how I was at the time. I got very impatient and I still took the fight anyway. So um, the only issue was my eyes was a little bit of the issues in the fight. But like I said, don't make no excuses. Still champions are just saw. I still got through the fight. It was, a, it was my first six rounder as well. Mm. And um, even though, you know, it went to decision, I didn't get knocked down, I didn't get dropped, anything like that. So I still put on a good fight. So obvious question in relation to that. How is your eye now? Obviously, you've had the surgery. You've had two fights since. How is it? Uh, my eye has been great ever since then, so. It's been holding up well since sparring and stuff, and my last fight held up well as well. So my eyes are definitely good, back 100%. That's good to hear. Now you've got quite a, you know, an impressive amateur background. You're a national champion, Golden Gloves finalist as well. When did, just tell us a bit about yes. the journey. So how old were you when you started boxing initially, and, and was it a long amateur career? I started boxing at the age of 17. Um, I was amateur for about 10 years. Wow. So, um, yeah, I was I was competing a lot. I had a total of 97 fights altogether. Um, lost 15 of them um, out of the 97. Um, for a lot of people, competition and stuff like that. But when I first started off, like, really wanting to get into it, my mom didn't want me to do it at all. Um, but I needed an outlet. She wanted me to play, like, basketball, but basketball really wasn't my thing. Like, I enjoyed watching basketball, but me playing it personally myself, I was just like, no. Um, it took a while for my mom to obviously give me the pass to box. Um, I found a gym, John's Boxing Gym in the Bronx, which was like Jerome Boxing Gym at the time. And um, I needed my parents' consent in order for me to box. And I was like, oh, this is going to be hard. <laughs> and then my mom was already against the wall about it. So I was just like, how am I going to get her to sign? And I was like, she's definitely not going to sign this paper. So I was just like, whatever. So I just forged my mom's signature and went. <laughs> and then um, I remember the first day that I decided to go into that gym, I wanted to like spar right away, right? I wanted to fight somebody. I'm like, I want to fight. I made a fight. He was like, so this is like this random coach at the time. He was like, you want to what? He was like, you want to do what? I was like, I want to fight right now. Who you got? So he puts me in there with like a golden glove at the time. <laughs> and uh, I get my butt kicked from corner to corner, busted nose, busted lip. I get hit with a body shot, take a knee. I even threw up after the sparring session was over. And I was like, oh, man, this is tough. <laughs> this is tough. So I was like, you know what? I really need a, I need a proper coach and I need the proper training in order to get into this. So I didn't get back inside the ring until a whole year after that. I trained for a whole entire year before I got back inside that ring. I didn't take no chances. So why did you decide to stay amateur for as long as you did? Because you're 30 years old now. It must have come to a point when you were, I don't know, 24, 25. You've been amateur for seven, eight years and thought now's the time to turn pro and make some money out of this talent. Absolutely. Um, around like 25, 26, I wanted to go pro. And then, um, you know, I spoke to a good mentor of mine, um, Sonia. 
um, from Gleason's gym. You probably know her, Sonia Lamanaka. She was a heavyweight champ as well. Um, and uh, she was like, you know, just get some more experience, get some national experience under your belt, get different looks, you know, different fighters and stuff like that before you make that transition. And I was like, and I felt that at the time, I thought I accomplished enough to make the transition. But then I was like, you know what? Let's go and get a national title. So I'm going to train my butt off. I'm going to make sure I do everything that I have to do to get this national title. And uh, I became a national champion. I was able to obtain that. And I became a Golden Glove finest because I decided to do the Golden Gloves another year. And I uh, fought Rashad Mahdi in the Golden Glove finals. Um, that went the distance. It was a great fight. Um, and then after that, that's when I decided, you know, it's time now. You know, it's time now. So before making that actual decision, my coach that I had for the whole amateur career, Coach Understanding, he passed me on to a professional coach who works with the pros, like the likes of um, Joshua Clotty and stuff like that. It was Kwame Asante. So he passed me on to him. And that's when I started to make my professional transition. Do you feel there's uh, a bit of a timer ticking away on you because you are a bit older than the average prospect or do you still feel incredibly fresh? I still feel incredibly fresh. Um, it's all about the experience that I've been gained from sparring a lot of the pro guys when I was an amateur as well coming up. Um, a lot of these guys, a lot of these boxers, they started way before me. Some of them started at the age of six, seven, eight, you know, and I beat some of these guys already, you know, that's been in the game way longer than me and um, attain and accomplish a lot more than them as well. So I'm not going to say age was a real factor here. The only thing I'll probably say will probably come over time, will probably slow down, is probably speed, but I'm still fast. <laughs> I'm still fast. I haven't lost my speed, haven't lost my reflexes. Um, that came natural to me, and uh, the hard work has always been there. So you mentioned um, sparring with some top pros while you were still amateur. Just tell us a yeah. little bit about that and, and who you learned the most from during that period. Um, stylistically, um, everybody's style was different, which was great. Like when I sparred with like Joshua Clotty, it was more of having a punch and move at the same time, creating more angles, not staying in one spot because he was, he was more of like a really solid pressure fighter. He always had his hands up. And if you strike and stay there, he was going to get you. It was automatic. So I always had to step around him. Sparring Isuf Kinda, Kinda, it was more of a, he liked to shoot the overhand right a lot. So I always had to be cautious keeping the left hand up, you know, me being a southpaw. So I had to always be cautious, keep the left hand up every time he tried to shoot that and set me up. He would try to faint at times with the jab and jab over my jab. But then I would I would take that from him and do it back. So I would learn at the same time. And then when I spar like another former um, world champion, Victor Kayo, him, he was very evasive. He was more like showboating a little bit, hands was down, but then he would throw punches at awkward angles as he would move. So I was like, oh, I kind of like that. You know, you step off to the right, you shoot the left, you step off to the left, you shoot the right, you know, you duck and you come over the top. I was like, oh, I kind of like that. So I started applying that to my style as well. So, cause like my style strictly like was just straight, straight boxer, right? I'm on my toes, I'm bouncing a lot. Then I was like, okay, now I'm going into the pros. I'm gonna have to sit down a little bit more on my punches. I gotta make these guys feel it. Now we in the hurt business. So then I became a boxer puncher through all that experience. So then when I get a guy hurt or stumbled or rock or I catch him with a good shot, I know how to sit down and finish him. And what about now? So either in the gym um, when you're training and you've got stable mates, obviously, or watching other fighters on TV and on YouTube, who do you look to for inspiration now you're a pro? Um, now that I'm a pro, I'll say, like, if I could go back a little bit, I mean, may he rest in peace, Pernell Whitaker. I always look at him stylistically. Um, current fighters right now, I look at uh, Terrell, uh, Errol Spence Jr., um, Terrence Crawford, um, Devin Haney as well, uh, Lomachenko. Um, I look at these guys defensively and also Tevin Former as well. Defensively, offensively, I look at the angles 
and what they do. So I look at it from both sides, from the southpaw stance, orthodox stance. I'm looking at the counter moves, what to do, what not to do, feet position, um, little side shuffles, feints. I'm looking at all of those and trying to apply that to my style as well, but making sure that I still keep my style and not become those fighters, but become a better version of myself. And tell us about your next fight. Have you, have you got an opponent for that now? So right now, we're actually in the works. We got two guys we're looking at. Um, one is a southpaw. He's about 5'9". Um, and then there's another guy, short, stocky kid. He's about, his record is like 4-2 and two or something like that. But he's a brawler. You know, he throws some wild shots and obviously can't stay in front of that guy or try to trade with him too much. Don't want to get clipped by any unnecessary shots. Um, but most likely, I'm probably going to outbox the both of them. Um, whichever one I get, I'm going to outbox them. But I'm definitely, it definitely looks like it's going to be a stoppage. Does it make it more difficult for you to do the preparation, especially in terms of getting the right sparring and so on, if you don't know whether you're going to be fighting a stocky orthodox fighter or a taller southpaw? Honestly, um, southpaws are very hard to come by when it comes to sparring. Uh, majority, vast majority of the fighters are all right-handed fighters. So you always get orthodox fighters in the gym, tall, short, stocky, you know, they're always around. The southpaws are really the hardest ones to find. There's not many southpaws out there. And just like a lot of guys, when they probably fought in the amateurs, they didn't come across a lot of southpaws, a lot of lefties. Um, I was like, in my amateur career, I think I only fought like one southpaw. You know, I haven't really come across southpaws like that. Um, as a pro, I fought two southpaws. Um, so southpaws don't bother me at all. I'm a southpaw, so I know how to fight a southpaw. I know what to look for as far as the angles go. Um, just finding them for sparring, that's the only issue. Um, if we don't find a southpaw, it's fine. We'll just use the right-handed fighters, and we'll just make some adjustments on the fly. I can, al I can also switch if I have to, so I can fight orthodox as well, which is something I have mastered now. <laughs> it took a long time, but I was practicing it. I didn't put no videos out there letting people know it, but I can switch now. Is there a way that people will be able to watch your fight on the show? Is there, I don't know if there's TV, but is there anything online? Yeah, so there's a there's an app, um, it's a bikery, and you can download it on the Apple Store, Android, Google is on the store. And it's also on Instagram as well if they want to um, follow them. So you can um, just go to watch at, uh, Vacary. I'll have it on my Instagram page as well. Uh, my Instagram is at Team2Sweet. Let me spell it out because I know a lot of people think I have numbers in my name and I don't. <laughs> it's just one big word. So it's T-E-A-M-T-O-O-S-W-E-E-T. -E 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 Team2Sweet. That's my Instagram. So I'll have the link on there as well. So everybody can watch as well. Excellent. Now you're a super lightweight, so it wouldn't be right of me not to ask this before we have to let you go. The big fight for this year in that division is of course, Josh Taylor and Jose Ramirez for all the gold at 140 mm -hmm. pounds. Who do you mm -hmm. like in that fight and why? Um, Honestly, it's going to be a tough, that's a 50, 50 fight which I like about it. I like champ fighting champ. And um, I'm going to say Ramirez might have a little bit of the lengthy height advantage against Josh. Um, and also the hand speed. He lets his hands go a lot more. You know, he has a higher punch output than Josh. But Josh is very slick, so you can't, you can't sleep on Josh. He'll catch Ramirez slipping in the inside. You know, we all seen what Ramirez did to Maurice Hooker, but, you know, these things happen in boxing, you know, you get caught with a good shot. Everybody has a puncher's chance. So I'm definitely going to call it a 50-50 um, fight. I don't think it's going to be a knockout in this fight. I definitely see it going to the decision. Brilliant. Well, really appreciate your time. Um, I look forward to watching your fight on the 12th of February next week. And um, very best luck. Hopefully we can catch up again in the future. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Thank you. Take care. All right, take care.